Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us um, at our webinar, professional webinar organized by the Anesthesia and Critical Care Professional Community. Um, the broad topic of our webinar is hot topics in orthotopic heart transplantation. We have designed the webinar as a, a multidisciplinary uh, event. We have a cardiologist, a cardiac anesthesiologist, and we were planning on having a surgeon as well. Unfortunately, Dr. Zuckerman, um, our surgeon, could not um, could not join us uh, for the webinar. Nonetheless, we we promise to keep you entertained. Um, as a, a structure for the webinar, we have um, a chat in which you can ask questions. Um, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will either um, reply to your questions on the go in writing, or we will save them uh, for the end to um, uh, discuss them as a panel. Um, I am one of the moderators. My name is Alina Nikora. I am a cardiac anesthesiologist at uh, Duke University, and I am the chair of the anesthesiology and critical care professional community. My partner uh, moderator is Dr. Eric DeWall, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. I cannot hear you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, my name is Eric de Waal. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist who work in the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Department of Cardiac Anesthesia since 1996. Uh, I'm the chair of the subcommittee of the uh, transplantation of ventricular, transplantation and ventricular assist devices of the European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiologists and Intensive Care. And I'm also a member as a professional community representative of the Interdisciplinary Network Mechanical Circulatory Support of the ISHLT. And I'm very happy to be the, your co-chair at this webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we're going to start our webinar. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Uh, Joseph Rogers. Both Dr. McCarty and my, myself have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Jo uh, Joe Rogers at Duke. He is a cardiologist specialized in heart failure. He is currently the president and CEO of Texas Heart Institute, and he is one of the past presidents um, of the ISHLT. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, for, for uh, joining us. Well, Alina and Eric, thank you very much for the kind invitation to participate. I have to say that it's really wonderful to see how this community has grown and flourished and organized. I very much remember being, you know, on the board uh, and then rising through the executive committee at ICHLT and having conversations about this unmet need to get our anesthesiologists and critical care physicians more engaged in the society. And so it's very exciting for me to participate in the, in the webinar, but just to see how this has grown under the leadership of many of the people who are on this call. So Alina and Eric, thanks very much to you for taking the leadership role and, and driving it forward. I think it's just a critically important part of what we do at ICHLT. Let me just go ahead and share my screen with you. Give me one second. So I believe that we should be in good shape. Let me know if, if it's not. <clears throat> so my task today uh, <laughs> is to describe a little bit about the U.S. heart allocation policy changes that occurred in 2018. And I, I find myself recently sort of traveling around the country trying to um, sort of defend this policy change. Uh, and it's partly because I was the chair of the UNOS Thoracic Committee when this was implemented. So a lot of the work that the committee had done leading up to this policy change was driven by me and several colleagues across the country. I, I'll highlight for you at the outset that this was a very data-driven process. Uh, you know, it wasn't just a bunch of people sitting around a room, um, you know, sort of making up what we thought the policy should be, but there was a re there's a, a large body of evidence to support the, the, the policy changes that were made. And I'm gonna highlight those for you. And I'll tell you where I think the policy hit the target. And I'll tell you where I think the policy missed the target. 
and, and I'll explain a little bit about why we missed in some cases. <clears throat> if you wanted to um, get just sort of a broad overview of what's happened with the, since the policy change, I'd refer you to this paper, <laughs> which unfortunately I don't actually have the, the exact citation, but Neil Matra, who was a medical resident uh, with us and, and, and me and a few others decided that we were gonna review the literature of what we had seen occur um, after the policy change, because there are so many people writing right now about the pros and the cons of the policy change. What we thought we would do in this one paper, which was published earlier in the spring, was just trying to collate all of that information into one place so that on that day, you would have a clear idea of, of how the policy change has impacted heart transplantation in the United States. And just again to remind you, and I, I apologize to the international colleagues, although I think that there are some messages here that translate to your specific countries and your regions, but this will be mostly focused <clears throat> on the U.S. policy change. The, the number of heart transplants being performed annually is shown in the graph uh, on the right, and there has been an increase over the last 20 or 25 years in the number of transplants a lot of that being driven by an increase in the number of donors in, in the United States, particularly, um, we believe that a lot of that's being driven or was being driven by um, the opioid crisis that we have been living through in the United States. And then more recently, so many people have begun thinking hard about uh, extending the number of donors through the use of, of um the OCS uh, systems of warm perfusion and also DCD transplantation. So I think that we're gonna continue to see the number of transplants going up. But in the United States, um, the, the um, prioritization and allocation of organs <clears throat> is driven by a, a governmental decree that was called the final rule. And some of the, the fundamental principles of the final rule are shown over on the left side. So they're, they're not prescriptive. The government doesn't tell us how to do this, but they give us some overarching themes that we should be thinking about as we design allocation and prioritization policy. So the first is that it should be based on sound medical judgment. I'm glad the government didn't interject themselves into that. They tell us that we should make the best use of these donated organs and we should distribute them as widely as medically reasonable to benefit the citizens of the country. We should avoid wastage of organs. And finally, that we should be considering um, making sure that the access to organs is equitable and that the, the placement and management of this entire process is efficient. And I think implicit in that is a cost efficiency that we need to at least talk a little bit about. So when we started looking at the data, there were a number of important challenges that we recognized in the old system. So this is in the system that was in place before 2018. First of all, in that first bullet, there, there were so many patients that were aggregated in the highest priority for heart transplant. And those the, their risk of dying on the wait list is shown in the graph on the right. So all of these different kinds of patients would have qualified for the highest priority for transplant before we changed the policy. And you can see that the risk of dying on the wait list ranged from between about five deaths per 100 patient years on the waiting list up to 1,500. So as an example of some of the problems we set out to solve, we said, geez, it would make sense for us to try to stratify patient risk a little bit better than this. Um, we <clears throat> recognized that there were an awful lot of patients who didn't, for whatever reason, didn't meet a criteria to be placed at a high priority. So Dan Myers and I went through several years of exception requests and tried to understand their risks of dying on the wait list and fit them into the prioritization strategies. You'll remember that in the years leading up to 2018, there was an explosion in the United States of mechanical circulatory support device support as a bridge to transplant. In fact, it had gotten up to almost 50% of the patients waiting for a heart transplant patient were waiting on a VAD. And we had no standardized definitions for adverse events. 
we knew that, and we thought that the, that lack of standardization was leading to disparities and in, um, in transplantation rates, and it was inequitable for the population of the country. So we built uh, definitions into the criteria for the policy change that define adverse events. The other thing that struck us was that severity of illness was often determined by physician decision rather than physiology. It was based on whether a physician decided to place a patient on an inotrope or whether, and, and there was no criteria to do that or put a PA catheter in someone or put a patient in the intensive care unit or put a balloon pump in. And so what we did in this new policy was we defined what, what cardiogenic shock is and with the idea that if you were going to declare your patient sick enough to move up on the transplant waiting list, by virtue of having shock, they had to meet specific objective criteria that could be measured and remeasured to justify why a patient should stay on that kind of support. The other thing that we defined in this was what important ventricular arrhythmia, what consisted of important ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and then finally, it was very clear that the geographic sharing was suboptimal before 2018. And I can give you a, an example, uh, and I'll use North Carolina where, uh, where Alina and Sharon and I practiced for many years at Duke. There were two transplant centers that were one, about a hundred miles apart. And we were in different um, uh, sharing regions in the United States. They're called DSAs. And so it could turn out that a patient would be called in and transplanted from home in Charlotte, North Carolina, in preference to a patient who 100 miles away was on ECMO at, in Durham, North Carolina. And while we might understand as, as health professionals, why they had that system in place, because it was easy to administrate. If you try to explain that to a patient whose family member was, or their, a family whose, whose family member was dying, it made absolutely no sense. And so one of the things we did was we expanded the geography of donor distribution, especially for the high priority patients. And so in this slide, you can see what we did. We went from a three-tiered system to a six-tiered system. And I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but the status ones are the highest priority, most critically ill patients. And we grouped them together based on their risk of dying on the waiting list. I'll show you that that actually, we picked a very sick group of patients. But as you move down the, the list, um, just from status two to status six, you can see that the severity of illness and the risk of dying begins to drop off. And I'll show you the data that supports the fact that we actually group these patients fairly well. We actually also gave some advantages to patients who didn't have it in the old system. So there was no accounting for adults with congenital heart disease. Some of the other conditions that are almost impossible to treat in other ways aside from transplantation like amyloid and some of the restrictive cardiomyopathies and there was no accounting for patients who needed multi-organ transplant in the old system. So the prioritization is shown on the left side of the slide. And on the right side of this slide, what I've done is shown you how we expanded the geography of, of recipients for an individual donor. And what I did was I just used St. Louis, Missouri as the, bull, the bullseye of this concentric circle graph. So let's say there was a donor in St. Louis, Missouri, right in the middle of this graph. For the highest priority patients, for the status ones and the status twos, they would be offered organs. Um, if there was a recipient in that bold green circle, they would be offered to status ones and twos in the bold green before it came back to less severely ill people in the center. This is distinctly different from the way it was, and it solved some of the problems that I mentioned about Durham and Charlotte, North Carolina. So the sickest patients have a broader geography from which they might get an organ. And that's the way we, we decided. And we actually, when we, just so you know, when we originally proposed this, that's a 500 mile radius. We originally proposed a thousand mile radius 
for the sickest patients. And as we as we socialized this new policy with the transplant community, they felt that that was too far. So we brought it back down to a 500 mile radius. Dr. Rogers. Yeah. May I ask you to go to slide view so that we can see your slides a little oh bit Oh my better. gosh, I'm so sorry. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. I thought that I, ha um, I had it. And so you must be here. Hang on one second. Let me stop sharing for one second and then mm -hmm. reshare with you. So how is, yeah, let me try one more thing. Hang on one second. How's that? Perfect. Very good. Perfect. So, so sorry, I thought I had it right. So let me show you some of the data from um, wh what we have seen over the last, you know, four or five years. <clears throat> so first of all, on the left side of the slide, which you can see is what the status of what the waiting list patients look like at the time that they're listed and the, the time they're transplanted. And as you can well imagine, there was sort of a more normal distribution that was sort of bell-shaped uh, on the left side of the slide pre. And as patients waited for the for their transplants in the old system, two thirds of them had progressed to the point that they were at the highest priority. So that's on the right side of the slide in the left column. And we're seeing the same kind of thing under the new system. Uh, a much more normally distributed um, at the time of listing, at the time of transplantation, you can see that there's some increase in the status ones, but it's not enormous, but they're really, there's beginning to get some congestion in the status two patients, about half the patients when they're transplanted are status two, with fewer threes, fours, uh, fives, and sixes. I use this graph to help me understand whether or not we stratified the patient populations well. And, and the left side of the slide, uh, you can see the old system. In the right, but below what you can see is the new uh, allocation policy and the impact it's had. You can see that the new status one patients have a very, very high risk for waitlist mortality, followed by the status twos. And in fact, the status two mortality was higher than the old status one A. So I think that we largely grouped these patients correctly, we actually had predicted that the, the waitlist mortality would be about the same between the status threes through the status sixes. Uh, so, and I, and then it, this is just another way to cut the data uh, on the right side of the slide. But again, I think highlighting the fact that we um, stratified this patient population fairly well. When you look at the different potential criteria that would qualify for a patient in each of those statuses, you can see that they cluster fairly well around some line. Uh, there's a couple of outliers. For example, I think the patients implanted with non-dischargeable surgically implanted um, VADs. These are uh, not the endovascular VADs like Impella or, or Tandem Heart, but surgically implanted pumps. They have a higher wait list mortality. And you might argue could be, if we we're going to reshuffle this, could be moved over to the status one categories. Some of the bad complications have a little bit higher risk. So I imagine that there could be some additional shuffling as we move forward to get the, to try to normalize the risk for waitlist mortality. This is a very complicated slide and I'm gonna to try to walk you through this quickly. So, so the UNOS regions are shown in the top right and that's how UNOS tracks their data. So you can kind of look at the, a, a map of the United States and relate it back to what you're seeing on the left side of the slide. So on the left side of the slide in these bar graphs are the different regions uh, of, that UNOS has identified, regions one through 11. And, and on the left side of the slide is the status at the time of transplant. And on the right side of each of those columns is the, is the status at the time of transplant in the new system, so old and new. So what I'd like you to just train your eye on is the variability in status 1A patients as you go from region to region, where you have a high, for example, in the, in the Northeast part of the country, like in New York, where almost 90% of the patients had deteriorated to the point that they qualified as a status 1A candidate. And then you've got other areas of the country, like in the Pacific Northwest in region six, where only about half of them 
had progressed to that point. So there was some inequity. And then what I'd like you to look at is in the right side of each of these regions, and you can sort of compare them, it's much more similar than it was before. So I think this highlights the fact that we're getting people transplanted a little more quick, quickly. There's a little more equity, hopefully, in the system. Here's where I think the policy failed. Um, we had predicted that we would reduce the number of exception requests. There was a dramatic increase in the number of exception requests. And I'm going to argue for this group that we don't actually know how this policy works because physicians believe that they're smarter than data. Uh, and, and so what they're doing is they're saying, well, the, my patient is sicker than these criteria, so I'm gonna ask for an exception to bump my patient up on the waiting list. And almost all exception requests are granted. What the committee subsequently did after the policy was released was provided some additional guidance around this. And what you can see on the right side of the slide is that that, that guidance that they provided has reduced the number of exception requests. Here's a, another piece of data about how we're doing with heart sharing. So on the left side of the slide, before we changed the policy on the right side after, you can see that before 2018, two thirds of the hearts were being distributed locally. And what we're seeing after the policy change is a nice reduction in local sharing and, a, and much more either regional or national sharing of the organs. So we actually have with our concentric circle model focused on the high risk patients, our sharing organs more broadly, and then increasing and improving the equity in the transplant system. And that, as you would guess, has resulted in an increase in travel distance and an increase in ischemic times. There's a lot of focus on this. Part of it's on cost, and I think that we have to be thinking about the cost of this system. Uh, and I'll show you in just a second that this increase in ischemic time, while always being linked to outcomes following transplantation, has not really resulted in a reduction in survival. Here's one of the real wins, I think, of the system. If you look today uh, at, at wait times, they've decreased overall from 112 to 40 days. Uh, but for the status one patients, for this very critically ill patient population, we're seeing mean, median days to transplant of about a week. For the status twos, between one and three weeks. And then as you continue to move down the line in less risky patients, their waiting times are longer. And we've done all of that without having a negative effect on post-transplant survival, at least out through two years. And here are the Kaplan-Meier curves with 95% confidence intervals, just demonstrating that there's not a statistically significant difference in post-transplant survival through two years in the new system. Of course, as you would anticipate, some of the sicker patients have higher post-transplant mortality, just like they did uh, before we changed the policy. And here's one of the other things that we didn't necessarily anticipate. Uh, and that is um, that the patients on durable VADs um, are, seem to have some disadvantage. And there's a real concern, I think, in the advanced heart failure community about this. And, and it's hard to justify transplanting stable patients on durable VADs because their mortality risk is very low at that point in preference to some of the other categories on the waiting list. But what I, the thing that I think is rather concerning, uh, and this was not anticipated, is that the risk of mortality uh, is higher following transplant off of a VAD uh, after the policy change than it was before. And we're going to have to understand this more deeply. So here are, just sort of to summarize and conclude, um, I would just highlight for you that, that I think that the policy has done a good job at improving waitlist stratification. I think that we have identified high priority listings. Um, there has been an increase in particularly temporary mechanical circulatory support as a bridge to transplant. And we can debate whether that's a good or a bad thing. There has been an increase in ECMO and balloon pump use. Um, and then I, I won't read all of these to you because it's a little bit, uh, you know, you can read. Here's the reference to that paper that I had made earlier. But I think what we've seen are reductions in wait time, reductions in wait list mortality, and a real focus on getting the sickest patients transplanted more quickly. A couple of other benefits of the policy change over here on the right. I think that the transplant community is now very interested and engaged in organ allocation. 
which is great because almost no one was thinking about it or writing about it before we changed the policy. And people have come up with some really innovative, great ideas about what things that we should be doing in the future. Um, I'm gonna again argue that this has not been well tested because so many people are asking for request, uh, requesting um, exceptions for their patients. I still think it would be interesting to see how well this works if we really followed the policy and followed the data that informed the policy changes. There are future plans to, to change the way we're allocating all, all organs in the United States. Hearts last on the list, but this idea of continuous allocation will once again shake this up just a little bit. And the other thing I'm just going to highlight for you is we cannot model physician behavior when we do things like this. We instantly saw a reduction in durable VAD implantation and instantly saw an increase in temporary mechanical circulatory support. There was just no way to model it. We predicted that there would be some of that movement. I don't think we predicted that it would be quite as dramatic as, as what we actually had seen. Uh, and, and, and the policy wasn't, you know, some people say, well, you're making us put in, you know, fill in the blank. Policy doesn't do that. That does, that, this is where physicians, I think, need to be sort of thoughtful, introspective about their program and be more thoughtful th about the fact that this is a national resource. This is not a local or, or a programmatic resource. And that we should be sharing organs across broader geographies to the benefit of the population. So, uh, Alina and Eric, thanks again. Uh, and I'll look forward to the Q&A session. Dr. Rogers, uh, many thanks for this uh, excellent and interesting presentation. I have already two questions, but I will keep them posted uh, during uh, uh, probably the Q&A session. And I urge the audience to, uh, to ask the questions in the chat. Uh, and we will soon discuss some of them at the end of the session. Then uh, I will introduce the next speaker, Sharon McCartney. She's an associate professor of anesthesiology at Duke University Hospital in Durham in North Carolina. She also represents the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists in this ISHLT webinar. And she has a lot of experience in heart transplantation and implantation of total artificial heart devices. And I'm very happy that she will introduce us to challenges in the period of management of primary graft dysfunction. Sharon, we are going to listen to you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeWall and Dr. Nakora for inviting me to give this um, webinar alongside Dr. Rogers. This has been fantastic. Um, so I'll talk about some of the challenges that we face in the perioperative management coming from an OR and ICU perspective um, in taking care of patients with PGD and heart transplant. Oops, there we go. Um, so first, quickly, um, you know, we, we know how to define primary graft dysfunction. This is from 2014. Um, this is separated, LVPGD is separated into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild meeting these hemodynamic or echo parameters and um, low inotropes, moderate having slightly higher inotropes or balloon pump, and then severe PGD being those patients on mechanical circulatory support for LV function. And then our RVPGD, which meets these criteria or need for RVAD. Um, PGD is kind of here to stay. There's um, donor characteristics, recipient char characteristics, and then procedural characteristics that all um, put patients at risk for PGD. Um, unfortunately, many of these are non-modifiable, especially those donor characteristics and recipient characteristics. And so PGD is here to stay, and we sort of need to um, get better and learn how to treat it um, effectively. There's um, quite a bit of challenges in treating PGD. Um, first, you know, medical versus mechanical management, what type of mechanical management, um, what timing, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> treatment of PGD is typically thought of in like a stepwise fashion. So first comes the inotropes, maybe then the pulmonary vasodilators, um, systemic or inhaled. Um, some institutions um, marry these together um, uh, uh, on initial treatment of, of the graft. Um, and then as, you know, there is graft dysfunction, uh, maybe we increase the inotropes, place a balloon pump, and then ultimately mechanical circulatory support um, in, in this um, figure, just in the form of VA ECMO. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of sort of representative case examples of what we see in the operating room and the ICU um, and talk about these challenges. So our first case is a 61-year-old female with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy um, who came in in cardiogenic shock um, with a balloon pump and underwent heart transplant. Um, this is her post-bypass um, echo and hemodynamics. She's on epinephrine 0.1 and inhaled Velitri. Um, and you can see the hemodynamics um, are poor. She has a cardiac index of 1.2, low SVO2, and um, RV dysfunction with some LV dysfunction as well. <clears throat> 
Um, so what do we do next? Um, for this patient, we went ahead and placed her on VA ECMO. Um, <clears throat> this is their, the echo um, of the patient immediately uh, on VA ECMO um, to rest the heart. Um, and then two days later in the operating room, um, the patient was brought back to the operating room. The epinephrine had been weaned from 0.1 to 0.06. Um, the inhaled bleacher was still going, and this is an echo on two liters of VA ECMO flow. And you can see here the hemodynamics are um, you know, stable. Um, and we take we took the patient off VA ECMO. This is on less inotropy than that first echo um, uh, at epi 0.06 and inhaled velitri. We have great hemodynamics. Our index is 3.2, SpO2 is um, about 70. Um, and this is follow-up of that patient two weeks later at the time of discharge. And you can see some RV dilation, but certainly the function, um, both LV and RV have significantly improved. So just some takeaway points from this case, um, early MCS was instituted in the form of VA ECMO in the operating room. Um, the allograft made a quick and significant recovery in about two days, um, resulting in decannulation. And the patient didn't suffer any additional end organ dysfunction, which I think is very important in these patients. And they were discharged two weeks postoperatively. So um, a little bit of increased length of stay, but you know, certainly two weeks post-op is, is certainly acceptable for a heart transplant patient. Um, this is a second case, 28-year-old male with non-ischemic non cardiomyopathy who um, underwent heart transplant. And this is his post-bypass um, echo. Um, epinephrine was up 0.1 mics per kg per minute. He was on dopamine 5 and then inhaled nitric. And you can see here the hemodynamics are certainly acceptable with an index of 2.8, good SVO2, good blood pressure. Um, you can see a little bit of LV dysfunction. Um, the RV is moving okay, Some, some certainly some mild dysfunction. Um, and this is still in the operating room, but one hour later, and you see that LV um, has decreased some um, in function over that time. We're still in the same inotropes. Our index has um, decreased a little bit down to 2.1. Our blood pressure is a little bit lower and our SVO2 has um, suffered a little bit as well. So um, we opted to place a balloon pump. And um, sometimes I think in these heart transplant patients, there's a, I'll call it a honeymoon phase um, where things are looking pretty good. Um, and we go up to the ICU and unfortunately, in the ICU, um, that honeymoon turns a little bit south. Um, so this is 10 hours later in the ICU. Um, uh, I can guess probably about 2 o'clock in the morning if I um, had to make such an assumption. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the hemodynamics have suffered um, and an echo was performed and showed this graft function. So here we have a cardiac index of 1.5, a low SVO2, and the patient is um, hypotensive. And you can see the LV function has significantly decreased. Um, you can see the RV function has also significantly decreased. So we placed this patient on VA ECMO, um, and this is the echo um, immediately on VA ECMO, two liters of flow and those same, same inotropes. Um, and this patient actually stayed on um, ECMO for seven days. Um, and this is when they came to the operating room to be um, decannulated. Um, we're still in those same inotropes, but we did add milrinone 0.125. And this is at one liter of flow. Um, and then subsequently, we were able to wean the patient off ECMO. And so this is off. And you can see significant recovery of the, the graft function. So that LV um, has nearly normal co contractility. And certainly the RV um, has certainly improved, maybe a mild dysfunction. Um, our index, our, our hemodynamics are great. Our index is 2.9. And our SVO2 here is 65. Um, so takeaway points from this case, um, increasing support can be dynamic um, based on the information at the time. We certainly don't have a crystal ball to, to know if that patient is going to um, you know, fly or if they're going to need um, increased support in a few hours. Um, and patients can have this initial honeymoon period with um, hemodynamics that look good that can start to suffer into um, hours into the ICU stay. Um, importantly, institution of VA ECMO before end organ dysfunction um, should be um, should be instituted. We certainly don't want a malperfused state, AKI, um, or or sort of digit ischemia or any um, end organ malperfusion. And this patient made a full recovery of LV function um, and and RV function within with seven days of ECMO support. So when we think of mechanical circulatory support in patients, you know, what is better, um, ECMO versus short-term BAD? Uh, we, we have some data. Um, uh, a lot of the studies are small. Um, this study was in 2017 came out of, it, that came out of Columbia. Um, it looked at 597 patients, 44 patients with severe PGD, and looked at ECMO versus short-term BAD support. Um, in this study, ECMO was associated with um, a higher bridge to recovery rate, 
Um, ECMO is also um, associated with shorter support time, five um, days versus 14, and a lower incidence of bleeding requiring re-expiration and lower incidence of AKI requiring renal replacement therapy. Um, Another question that always comes, do we put patients on ECMO early or do we put them on um, later and try to get through with uh, medical management um, before putting a patient on VA ECMO? This study also came out of Columbia in 2019, small, small study with 362 patients, 38 with severe PGD, um, and looked at you know conservative versus prompt ECMO. Um, it did obviously show a difference in the timing to initiation of ECMO. Um, seven hours would be that um, conservative and about two hours would be the prompt. Um, and it showed no difference in ICU length of stay or major complications, but there was a trend towards in-hospital mortality improvement and one-year survival improvement, but both were non-significant. But again, this was a small study. So, um, a different group in 2023 published a much larger study looking at 2,000 patients, um, 500 with PGD, um, and uh, 242, 242 that received uh, mechanical circulatory support. And they looked at early versus late. They defined early MCS within three hours after cross clamp removal and late MCS um, after three hours uh, from cross, cross clamp removal. They saw no difference in time on mechanical circulatory support, intubation time, length of stay, rate of death, neurologic complications, or infection rate, but the late MCS had worse renal function at one month post-transplant um, and was associated with more peripheral vascular damage. And I think that's one thing that we've um, discovered, especially taking care of patients um, with a lot of PGD, is that um, early ECMO um, uh, is good to sort of prevent that renal dysfunction, the AKI requiring CRT. Um, and, you know, ultimately that will decrease your length of stay and improve outcomes. Um, it, at least in the study in uh, mortality survival, they did not show a significant difference in early versus late. ECMO support um, typically will range from about three to eight days post-transplant. Um, longer duration of support will predict poor myocardial recovery and increase mortality. Um, so just a couple takeaway points. Early MCS is key to prevent end organ damage from um, borderline or suboptimal hemodynamics. There can be this honeymoon period with subsequent decline in function and hemodynamics. And VA ECMO is preferred over temporary VAD in the management of PGD. Um, and typically ECMO support is brief, um, about three to eight days. Myocardial recovery does typically occur. Um, and um, oftentimes the patients do quite well. Um, some of the challenges that we do um, face in the perioperative period are concomitant bleeding, concomitant vasoplegia. Um, in an ideal world, um, these are all separate, but as we know, taking care of you know, real, real patients, um, at times these are intertwined. Um, one of the issues with perioperative bleeding, you know, especially if you have RVPGD, which is the most common um, uh, cause of PGD, most common ventricle that can cause then can have PGD, is that you know, if you're having perioperative perioperative bleeding, you're having to give all these blood products, that RV may not tolerate the volume of blood products needed, um, necessitating some increased support and perhaps mechanical circulatory support. Sort of on the other side, if you put the patient on ECMO, this may worsen coagulopathy, worsen ongoing perioperative bleeding, um, and sort of, you know, put you in a, a more blood product situation. And so these have to be, you know, thoughtfully um, managed and and certainly if the if the RV cannot tolerate the volume of blood needed to resuscitate the patient, then um, early ECMO um, should probably be used. And in that one study, you know, it didn't really show an increase in um, uh, in coagulopathy and, and perioperative bleeding uh, with the use of ECMO. Um, our, another issue that we face is vasoplegia. This is defined by profound hypotension, low SVR, normal or increased cardiac output, and a blunted or absent response of fluids and vasopressors. Um, it occurs in about 5 to 25% of patients that undergo cardiac surgery on bypass, but um, affects a significantly higher proportion of heart transplant patients, um, which can be up to 60% in some, some studies. And there's certainly a lot of risk factors, um, such as prior, prior LVAD, um, that can increase that risk. Um, this is um, one of the thoughts for mechanisms of uh, vasoplegia. Um, and um, potential um, therapeutic strategies such as methylene blue, um, B12, vasopressin, um, and angiotensin II um, antagonist. Um, unfortunately, some of our alternative agents like the methylene blue or B12 or Giapresa, which is an anti angiotensin II antagonist, all increase pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you already have um, RVPGD and you're increasing your PVR, 
um, this certainly can worsen RV dysfunction um, and sort of uh, lead you in, into um, needing more support. Um, on the flip side, you know, use of high dose vasopressors will lead to end organ is ischemia. And certainly if you're on high doses of norepinephrine, uh, vasopressin, et cetera, um, this can cause a malperfusion, mal malperfusion state. So oftentimes we have to really think about, you know, what the patient in front of us, if they can tolerate this um, uh, increase in PVR, it is short lived um, and um, often can uh, lead us to wean our pressors. Um, and so risk benefit has to be weighed here. Um, some of the options for management of basoplegia um, are steroids. All of our patients in this in this population get steroids, so that's already done. Um, pressors such as norepinephrine, vasopressin, um, some use of dopamine can be um, uh, can be thought of as well in the literature. And then, like I said, judicious use of uh, B12 or methylene blue or Giapresa because um, these do increase PVR. And so you you have to um, take it as a risk benefit um, and look at each individual patient to see if they can tolerate these adjunct agents. Um, another challenge that we face in the treatment of PGD is discrepancy between echo findings and hemodynamics. It's great when these are married, um, such as these patients, you know, we have um, a great echo with great hemodynamics or um, a dilated RV poorly functioning with um, terrible hemodynamics. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in reality, sometimes we get a little mixture of both. We have an index of 1.9 and SVO2 that's kind of borderline there at 60, and we perform an echo and we say, man, I don't know, it looks pretty good. Um, or, you know, conversely, we have great hemodynamics and um, you, you're you um, in the operating room looking at this echo and you're like, oh, man, this RV is um, barely moving and we have a TAPSI of 1.2. Um, one of the issues that the, that these discrepancies can occur is um, because the right ventricle has two forms of um, contractility, both radial motion and longitudinal motion um, in a healthy um, patient such as this. Um, but in the heart transplant um, patient, the longitudinal uh, contractility significantly decreases and the radial contractility um, overcompensates for this. And so for instance, in this patient where the RV looks terrible in this four chamber view, if you go to an RV inflow outflow view, you actually see um, quite a bit of compensation and, and sort of hyper -contract contractile um, RV um, in that view. Um, so what do we do when there's a dis discrepancy between echo and hemodynamics? The way that I approach this is if the hemodynamics are poor, then I use echo to diagnose what the issue is. Is it the RV? Is it the LV? Or is it both? If both look okay, then we can calculate a cardiac output from echo to verify our PA catheter cardiac output. And perhaps a P it's a PA catheter issue, which does occur. Um, and if the hemodynamics are okay, but the echo looks terrible, um, just continue to cautiously monitor the patient. Because like I said, you may not be capturing um, sort of the full story. And certainly we see RVs um, in, in many populations that look like um, they're on the, the verge of failing and they are you know, producing great hemodynamics and the patient's hypertensive and, um, and you know, so, so it is. Um, what do our outcomes look like in PGD? So um, in mild, moderate, and severe, there is an increasing um, risk of in-hospital mortality um, uh, based on the grade of PGD. Um, reaching 40 to 50% of in-hospital mortality or retransplantation in severe PGD. Um, and there is a difference in survival um, with in patients with PGD versus no PGD at all time points, including 30 days, one year, five years, and a 10-year follow-up. Um, some of the other outcomes of PGD, there are higher AKI rates, um, there are higher total ICU hours, higher ventilator hours, higher reoperation for bleeding, um, higher blood product transfusion, length of stay, and then higher cost because of all of these things. These are all costly um, interventions. Um, so just to summarize, PGD is here to stay. We must know how to treat it. Um, early MCS is preferred, VA ECMO preferred over temporary VAD, which has changed in the past um, few years as a sort of culture and with, with some data. Um, time heals many things, including PGD, and support is typically only needed for a few days, and that heart um, typically does recover. And then vasoplegia and perioperative bleeding can be challenging uh, co-founders in these patients. And in a subset of patients, echo and hemodynamic discrepancy can make interpretations very challenging. Thank you. Please don't cut. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, we will start with questions. We do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, 
I will start with the first uh, question for Sharon. In your experience, how much stability is needed before uh, uh, contemplating weaning the patient off um, ECMO after after heart transplantation? I know you take care of these patients in the intensive care unit, so it's a very good question for you. Yeah. Um, so as far as stability, the patient does need to be um, stable, um, and I I use hemodynamics to define that stability. Um, Certainly, the patient could be on a little bit of norepinephrine or vasopressin for SVR. Um, we typically will wean the inotropes um, a bit while we're um, on on ECMO, um, and that way we have some room to go up if we need to as we wean the patient off. Um, we will do trials um, uh, in the ICU before taking the patient to the operating room to take them off ECMO. And um, what we do is, you know, it, we will if the patient's on three liters of, of VA ECMO or four liters, we'll take them down to three to two and then down to one. We don't go further than one. And um, importantly, I'll look at the hemodynamics at each step and then if the, um, and then look at the echo. If the hemodynamics start to suffer, um, similar to what I said, if the hemodynamics start to suffer, then I look at the echo to diagnose what the issue is. Is it an LV problem or an IV problem? If the hemodynamics are good, then I just sort of do a comprehensive echo at each step just to look at everything, make sure I'm not missing anything. If the patient tolerates that one liter of flow hemodynamically, the echo looks good, then we typically say this patient is ready to come off. Okay, Sharon, uh, thank you very much for this uh... A huge explanation of this question. We have a question from the audience. Um, for example, um, uh, there is a question, which factors do you believe can be modified and prevented if and during the transplant procedure to avoid severe PGD? Unfortunately, there's not a lot that um, we can modify. You know, things like ischemic time can be modified, but you know, the, the organ has to come from somewhere. So, um, uh, you know, the, we are working on modifying those with things like transmedics, um, uh, organ care perfusion devices, or with cold um, alterations of cold, cold storage. Um, but, you know, once it's there, <clears throat> it's kind of a non <clears throat> sorry, a non-modifiable factor. Um, as far as other things in the operating room, um, I don't think there's a ton that we can we can modify except, you know, minimizing complications, uh, minimize, minimizing bypass times. Okay. Um, uh, I have a okay, go. I have a question for Dr. Rogers. I know that he has been very active and re replied to some questions in the chat, but um, I've seen you, you have shown nicely how hearts are now distributed, not uh, regionally, but more nationally. Um, however, ischemic time does not seem to have been impacted in terms of resulting in worse outcomes. Do you think this is a result of um, the um, evolution of the ex vivo perfusion system and implementation of this uh, of these systems? Yeah, Alina, I mean, I think it's a great analysis to do, and I don't know the answer specifically to your question, but you'd have to think that it should have some impact. I, my initial reaction to your question was, although there has been an increase in ischemic times, it's not dramatic. And I don't know that we've crossed a threshold yet where we would actually begin to see at a population level some change in outcomes. So if you're just looking at the, the data sort of from a 30,000 foot level based on what the policy has done, I just don't think that we, although the ischemic times are longer, they're probably not long enough to have a negative impact on survival. Can I ask Sharon a quick question about PGD? <laughs> so Sharon, I mean, one of the things that we had gotten interested in for a while was how donor management impacted the risks of PGD. And one of the things that we had noticed is that there was sort of um, unfettered use of, of thyroid replacement in donors. And I, one, we'd gotten very interested for a while in whether we were taking hearts out in a very energy depleted state and then using, you know, sort of cold storage for several more hours and whether that was contributing. I, do you have any thoughts about sort of some of the donor management issues that might be related to sort of mitigation strategies? <clears throat> 
Um, that's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of experience in this, but I can tell you that, um, you know, based on those thoughts and the thyroid hormone, now donor management, I, I do think has been um, more consistent in replacing thyroid hormone. I know that we were replacing it at that time period that you were talking about um, in the operating room after cross clamp removal. Um, because the donor management with thyroid hormone has been more consistent, we have stopped that. Um, uh, so, you know, I think they've, you know, some feedback was given and um, I'm told by Dr. DeVore at our hospital that that has gotten better, but I don't have a um, firsthand perspective. Um, I have another question to Dr. Rogers. Uh, you know, in long-term transplantation, we have the long allocation scale, or long allocation score. And in some patients with a high long allocation score, for example, 80, 90, we have to do some sometimes accepting marginal donor lungs for transplantation, and then we eventually put, can put them on EVLP. What about uh, patients with a higher uh, uh, score uh, for uh, getting heart transplanted uh, with marginal donors? Do you put them on DCD, uh, is there, or do you put them on an ex vivo perfusion, and are there, what are problem topics or issues or uh, things to do to improve uh, lung function of uh, cardiac function. Yeah, so thanks, Eric. Uh, two quick responses. I mean, I think a lot of people, when we put out the 2018 policy change, were hoping that we would have a heart allocation score in, in an attempt to replicate what the successes, I think, that you'd had in lung transplantation. We had some real data deficits in heart, uh, and we we had a hard time tracking patients through their illness. Um, we had data when they were listed. We oftentimes had data when they were transplanted, but not a lot in between. We had almost no data on presensitization. And so one of the things that was built into the 2018 policy change was a more robust data collection with the mindset that we would try to emulate the successes of the lung allocation score. I do think that you're right. I think that there, there's a, now, I think, some tools that we have in the toolbox that weren't really even being utilized in heart in 2018. And I think this idea that you all have pushed forward about kind of rejuvenating marginal organs on an ex vivo perfusion platform is really an exciting opportunity for us. And I think we're beginning to see this in, in heart transplantations. People are you know, watching those hearts for a little bit longer time, seeing what they can do to improve the performance of some of these marginal organs. So I do think that that's the future of heart transplantation. And especially for some of these very high-risk patients, if you can rejuvenate those organs, I think it's just gonna expand the donor pool more. Um, Eric, I, I do have a question for you, given that we talked a little bit about PGD management, but from more from an American uh, perspective, can you share with us uh, if there are any uh, specifics, any, any, anything different that you, you do in terms of management of PGD at your institution? Thank you, Aline, for this uh, great question. Uh, well, um... Uh, reviewing the purse rate survey, which will be published uh, 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 within a few uh, few months, there is a uh, difference in policy in uh, preemptive management in LVAT implantation. So there might be also a difference in in uh, management of heart transplantation and primary graft dysfunction. We, for example, do in our hospital about 20-25 heart transplants a year, both after DCD and DVD donation. And of course, we prepare ourselves uh, well at the beginning of the heart transplantation to optimize uh, the, the, the acceptor for the oncoming uh, uh, implantation of the donor heart. And we, for example, use nitric oxide, uh, norepinephrine, and dobutamine from the beginning in order to improve the function. Um, well, but then uh, after, uh -huh. after implantation of the donor heart, uh, well, some patients will do well and they go to the intensive care and they'll they recover well and they will be extubated soon. But yes, yeah, some of them perioperatively, well, then you can see on echocardiography that they have a an, uh, an moderate or a bad uh, left ventricular and or RV function. Uh, 
So if it's moderate, then we go over to optimize the inotropic support. We wait and well, probably we add epinephrine because we hardly use epinephrine instead of, for example, if uh, we look to the uh, Harefield Hospital in London, where I worked for three months, they are very used to use epinephrine during cardiac surgery in order to improve cardiac function. But we at our hospital do very, very uh, less use epinephrine. So if we, we give epinephrine, then we have to be careful in order not the patient will uh, become worse in the intense care unit. Uh, if the patient has a severe peripheral graft dysfunction early after transplantation, uh, then we put in a uh, VA ECMO and then the patient goes with VA ECMO to the intensive care in order to find out uh, what's going to happen and uh, to maintain uh, and improve uh, autocrat on organ oxygenation. Thank you so much. We, um, um, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Um, Sharon, do you think you can uh, elaborate a little bit on the use of, um, the question is specific regarding use of uh, nitric oxide, but I think it can be applied to all inhaled pulmonary vasodilators in the setting of using um, medication for treatment of vasoplegia such as methylene blue and B12. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a controversy. Um, so in our patients, we use inhaled pulmonary vasodilators on all um, transplant patients. And so for us, that is already on. And so if the patient is um, experiencing vasoplegia um, and needs one of these adjuncts, and we feel that the patient can hemodynamically tolerate the increase in PVR, the short-lived increase in PVR that this these adjuncts, uh, methylene blue and um, uh, B12 causes, we do leave that inhaled pulmonary vasodilator on. Um, I don't know of any cases in which um, perhaps in a non-transplant patient, there was not um, an inhaled pulmonary vasodilator on and it was added to um, offset the increased PVR, um, but certainly that is already on. Um, you know, is it effective? You're, you have a nit you're giving nitric oxide and you have a nit nitric oxide scavenger. So I, I see it as a net neutral um, until um, uh, those effects of PVR are, um, uh, have, have gone away and they do subside, um, pretty quickly. It's, it's only, um, typically for a few minutes that that increase in PVR occurs and then it does subside. You just have to, um, uh, you just have to, you know, know if your patient can tolerate that, that increase for that time period. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I think we are uh, getting close to the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, we want to thank you for your very active participation in the chat. Um, we will save all the questions in the chat and those that have remained unanswered, we will um, answer them in writing and we will post them on ISHLT Connect. Um, I have one announcement to make. There will be another um, very promising webinar on the 1st of November uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time from the cardiothoracic surgery um, professional community. Uh, the topic is perioperative optimization in heart and lung transplantation. Uh, so with, uh, with this announcement, um, I would like to thank you all for your participation and we hope to see you uh, again at uh, other ISHLT uh, webinars. Thank you.